OK, this is the uh, Advanced Differential Amplifiers lecture. What we're going to do, we're going to look at differential amplifiers that you've already seen. We're then going to take it a little bit further and we're going to start looking at um, Cascode. And then we're going to take it a little bit further again and start looking at current sources in, in the design, current sources in the tails, current mirrors in the active load, and then we'll finally look at um, uh, Cascode structures. OK, if we consider um, this small signal equivalent model for the design, what we have to do inside this design, um, when we're actually looking at our circuitry, we have an input on one side and an input on the second side. These currents are going to come in to node X. Okay. Now in a properly balanced differential amplifier, these currents should be equal and opposite. That effectively means that X here can be thought of as 0 volts. We also have here our effective values of RC. Okay, In a properly balanced mirror, again, they're also going to be the same value. The current coming in is IB, and we have B to IB worth of gain. You might see many textbooks actually using the term GM. GM effectively is 1 over RE. So I'll just quickly recap that. We know RE, the emitter resistance, is actually equal to VT, thermal voltage divided by the emitter current. Okay. Um, in many textbooks you'll see a parameter GM and GM effectively is exactly the opposite. It is IE over VT. Well, something's going wrong with my Wacom tablet here. Today. So if we look at this model, number one, the main factor we can work out is this model is a bit too complex. What we need effectively, as with all analog, is to form on some simplifications. If we use the right simplifications, we can effectively make this model a lot simpler, and therefore we can actually utilize this model. What we're going to have to do is we're going to have to look for the symmetry in this design. If we look for the symmetry in this design, we notice that, in effect, everything on this side is exactly the same as everything on that side. What's important is the currents are effectively equal and opposite. So, for example, this would be in phase an out of phase component for this phase. So this might be plus IB, some sort of voltage, and this is minus IB through some sort of voltage. So in effect, we're going to come up with two things. We're going to come up with number one, we're going to come up with a differential mode for this um, design so that we actually cancel currents. And then we're going to simplify again and come up with a second model for the common mode. So we're going to have two different designs for our small signal equivalent model. Let's start here. The focus, quite clearly, is differential. When we're looking differentially, we're looking at this signal and this being the antiphase signal. So for example, quick sketch here. This is our input sinusoidal signal. What is coming in on this side will be the minus sinusoidal signal, an antiphase signal component. We've already established that IB will be caused by that V in, and over here we're going to have exactly the complementary value of IB. So when these two cur currents come into this node, and these two currents, fed from two current sources, come into this node, node X, they're going to have equal and opposite magnitudes. Therefore the current here is zero. Therefore this resistance doesn't appear like it's there. Therefore this node, or this line, can be thought of as zero volts. Therefore We've only now got RC. So our model simplifies to this model. OK? Forgot to label RC there. So as you can see, remember at the very beginning of the course we looked at common emitter amplifiers? The reason we did that is that differentials, when we're looking at differential mode, basically look like our differential signals. We've effectively got an equation or a calculation for V out 1 as a function of V in 1, where V in 1 also has the antiphase component as well. We've effectively simplified the model, looking at only half the components. The symmetry effectively cancels. We can basically get to our AV equation and eff effectively say that our voltage gain is minus RC over RE. 
Okay, RE being VT over IE. Okay, textbooks might also have that as minus GMRC. So the dynamic current in the tails has effectively been cancelled. We've now got a very simple amplifier circuit and a very straightforward model to work from. Common mode. Common mode is very different. Common mode means, let's draw a little sketch here, we have a sinusoidal signal coming in on one side, and on the opposite side, we have the same sinusoidal signal coming in. They're both in phase with each other. That means V in 1 is equal to V in 2. They're not antiphase. They're not going to cancel at node X. They're different. What are we going to do? We have our base currents and our collector currents all feeding in at one node. So what will happen? Well, again we can look at this circuit and we could split it down the middle and think, well hang on, can it simplify? What's over here and what's over here? Let's have a look. If we did this, we've taken that resistor, RT, and we put two resistors in parallel. Two times RT. The question we should ask ourselves is, what current is actually flowing between the two circuits? Is there any? Is there none? Is it exactly the same? If I apply a voltage here, which causes a current here, which causes a current here, that goes down through there. It would be exactly the same current here and exactly the same current there forging down there. So is there any current flow in the centre? The answer we can guess is no. What we've now done though is we've redrawn this circuit with two resistors in the tail. The obvious split now, if we take half that circuit, is only to look at one half of it. Let's see what that simplifies to. Here we go. We now have our output, RC. We have our emitter tail resistance and our input resistance. So if we were to write out some equations for the small signal equivalent model, our first statement would be V out is equal to, I'm sorry, my pen tab seems to be going a bit funny here, IB beta RC. If we were to write out one for V in, V in is a little bit different. V in is this voltage and this voltage. It's the classic emitter feedback or the degenerated emitter. Okay, V in is therefore equal to IB RBE. Okay, that's this voltage drop noted here or this current flow plus IB beta times IB into 2RT. So we'll write that as 1 plus beta IB RT times 2. Okay. If we now resolve all of that down, we can calculate AV. AV refines itself, if you do all of the maths, to minus RC divided by, we can also simplify because we can say RT is large, 2 RT. Okay, so we've now calculated what our common mode gain is going to be, and we have, effectively, a simplified circuit. It looks like that standard CE design plus degeneration. Remember the degenerated emitter, very powerful to us. Bit of feedback. If we want to measure performance, we often need to do some work. We need to look at differential gains. Why not get AUCAD to do the work for us? Why do we have to do the calculations and extract the data? The simple answer is we don't. We can use goal functions inside AUCAD in the probe tool, or we can, I think the term on it is 
measurement. If you want to find out exactly how to do that, please look at the AUKAD FAC. Okay. Oh, I don't know what's going on with my pen type here. Okay, AUKAD FAC, and I think it's something um, parametric, parametric changes. No, measurements, measurements. There's a measurements option inside there. If you look at the measurements inside the inside the AUKAD FAC, we actually go through calculating differential signals, single signals, and using some very simple functions called max, okay, of a voltage, or min, okay, of a voltage. Okay, so there's lots of things you can do. We're going to use this kind of approach now to calculate the theoretical and the practical differential mode gain, often referred to in the text as ADM. Here's one I've prepared earlier. I have my basic differential amplifier. I'm running 4 milliamps down in the tail. Therefore, down each branch, I'm running 2 milliamps. OK, down each branch, 2 milliamps. My input DC level on these two inputs is 1 volts DC, and I'm injecting a 10 millivolt sinusoidal signal differentially between those two those two points so one will be V in A is the in phase and V in B is the anti phase I want to achieve 1 volt AC output okay so what my criteria is here I don't really care about I'm not really bothered at the moment about the DC I'll accommodate whatever I can get away with but what I do need, I need a 1 volt sine wave signal coming out. If you do the maths on that one, uh, we, we know what our gain is supposed to be. So, here's our output waveform that we can see here. And here is our input waveform. We can see our input waveform is not perfectly biased to 1 volt DC because of the design of the rest of the circuit. It's the same circuit that you've been using in Lab 7 for a different spec. What I've done here as well is I've measured the peak-to-peak -peak signal on the input and on the output, okay, using AUKAD. In doing that, I calculated my output signal, my input signal, gave me a gain of 99.66. However, mathematically, when I designed this component, I designed it for a gain of 110. So I think I made a mistake here looking for 1 volt output. I think I wanted something a little bit different than that. 1.1 1. Uh, 1 might, maybe. What we can see here is classic analog. You know, you design for one value and you get close. I would then normally go back in and optimize. So as you can see, we're never quite as accurate as we want to be. We're always a little bit away from our target spec, but we can always optimize it in to get to that value. We may find out that our collector co or sorry, our tail current isn't quite as accurate as we thought, therefore our collector current isn't as accurate as we thought. So maybe we want to make minor modifications to our collector load resistance. But we have found out mainly ADM, the differential mode voltage, uh, differential mode gain. If I change the circuit, so now I have short circuited the two input lines, so they're both reading the exact same voltage, and I only need to read out one output signal, so I'm only reading V out A. Again we have the same target spec, four milliamps in the tail. It's the same design, so it's the same inaccuracy in this case. V in DC is 1 volt, V in AC is 10 millivolts. Um, slight error there because I was aiming for 110. I couldn't be bothered to make these two DC measurements, 
but we could if we wanted to extract them from here. If we know maximum minus minimum divided by 2 gives us the point in the middle, add that to um, the minimum value, you'd find something about 774 millivolts. Okay? And here we do exactly the same thing at this point and at this point. Calculate the difference between the two. Calculate the midpoint. Okay? And then add that to the lowest level. You could, if you wanted to, look for something called the point of inflection on the sine wave. The point of inflection is where the gradient goes from negative to positive. So it goes through uh, a particular uh, you know, shift in effect. Again, you can do that on the uh, probe tool, if you wish. I've measured my output voltage signal, and I already had my input voltage signal. If we put those two into AV, we get 0.62. So again, that's a very, very low magnitude gain. In fact, it's an attenuation because it's less than 1. If we look at our AV equation from theory, it's supposed to be RC over 2RT. The actual equation came out with 0.265. So in this case, we're actually quite close, theoretical to practical measured. Now what use is these two values? We've got a value of differential gain and a value of common mode gain. Well, the value comes when we put the two together. When we put the two together, we're looking at the common mode rejection ratio, okay? CMRR, okay? That's what you're going to see everywhere. What's important about common mode rejection ratio? The bigger the number, the better it's going to be. It's the ability of the differential amplifier to attenuate the common signal and amplify only the difference between the signals. So the highest the value, the better. If we look at our design, we had 99.62 and 0.262. We therefore had a common mode rejection ratio of 379. If we express that 379 in log terms, so we look at the dB ratios between the two, we now find out that in our circuit, which had a resistor in the uh, tail uh, position of the, two, of the two differentials, we've got about 51.5 dBs worth of um, rejection. That's, that's okay, but it's not very good. Modern operational amplifiers can have them well into 100 dBs. So that's the sort of number that you should probably find in laboratory 7. Okay? Lab 7 Ballpark is all about you analysing and designing for a particular target spec and then measuring ADM, the differential mode gain, and ACM, the common mode gain, with a view to calculating the common mode rejection ratio and, of course, putting that into dBs as well. Let's move on. If we want to improve the design of this current source, one of the ways we need to do that, we need to look at those equations that we had. The equations, if you recall, for ACM, the common mode gain, were you know, minus RC divided by 2 RT. Well, if we can manipulate RT and make it to a large value, we can effectively reduce the value of ACM, the common mode gain. One device that we know of is the current source. We've done a lot of work on current sources. If we put a current source in the tail of this differential, we know two things. We can calculate what value it will be, or it will provide in current, because that's part of the design work. However, we also know that it's got a very high resistance or effective output impedance. If we combine the current source and the differential, we're going to get a big performance gain. In differential terms, it won't mean a great deal to us, because the amplifier will still work and still provide the same sorts of differential performance. However, in common mode terms, as RT gets larger, 
the gain gets reduced. So we're going to significantly improve uh, the common mode gain. Oh, you could think of reduce rather than improve, because by improve the common mode gain, we want it to be very, very small. We don't want any gain there. Let's move on and have a look. So your laboratory 8 just happens to look like this, okay? Lab 8. In this position here, we have our circuit to measure the differential mode gain, and over here, we have your circuit for measuring the common mode gain. And you're building a very simple beta helper current reference line. And you're then building two output stages, so you're driving two lots of current, one into each of these differentials. The target specification is 4 milliamps in each case. As you can see here, I, I seem to have optimized this for target spec. The specification in, that I have chosen for myself here is my reference line is exactly 1 milliamp, and my outputs should be exactly 4 milliamps. You can see here my error factor is about 2%, 1.8%. Okay, so I'm, I'm not too bad. I'm not too worried about that. I'm slightly over in my currents in the tail, but remember this is beta plus 1 because we have the base current, so my collector current is actually quite accurate. That's 0.3% within spec, or sorry, 0.3% error of spec. So I wanted 2 milliamps down here, and I got 1.997, so I'm very, very, very close. Well, I've designed this circuit, implemented it inside AllCAD, and then I've measured my voltages. My V in peak to peak, oh no, was it that? My V in peak voltage was 9.906 millivolts. My V out differential peak, so I've just chosen, for example, one of these and looked at the peak value of that, <coughs> subtracting, of course, the DC bias, 1.0046 volts. I then looked at my common mode output. So I put the same signal in here. Remember, I've got my short circuit to V in and V in, well, V in A, V in B. And then I'm measuring only one side of the differential via OCMA, common mode, and I obtain this value, 18.59 microvolts. Micro is important. So if I write ADM, differential mode gain was 101, common mode gain, 1.83, 10 to the minus 3. That is very low, okay? It is a low value of gain. In fact, it is a huge attenuation. If I plug that into the common mode rejection ratio, we now end up with 54,000. Okay? So we've got a very large number. Put that into dBs, it's going to be a little bit more scalable, and we end up here. We've got 94 dBs with the re uh, rejection of the common signal in favour of the differential. Conclusive proof, I think, that b the building blocks of analog electronics that we were working with, that we've worked on so far, most certainly are the current source, and now we've seen the differential. Let's move on. Well, we need to look at some advanced designs. We can't, we can't stay where we are. We need to move along. How can we get even higher gain? We're going to find out, number one, by removing resistors, the RC component, and putting in a current mirror. We're going to have ridiculously high gains from a couple of transistors. So from a four transistor design plus current source, you're talking gains of thousands. We're also going to look at something called cascode. That's where a common base follows the common emitter. I'll show you more in detail in a moment. Effectively, therefore, we end up with a beta squared gain. It's not quite as good as the gain above, but it is quite a useful gain. It has some very useful properties, mainly featuring from the common base. Low input, in, uh, input uh, resistance for one.
We're also going to look at a terminology called super beta designs, which often actually means cascode, possibly with some special re restrictions on voltage drops, and possibly also mirror loads as well. Let's have a look. A mirror in the load power. Here we have our standard differential amplifier. We've got our current reference uh, set up here, and we have a current source in the tail, by T. We know how to design this. You should be able to do this blindfold by now. I've done it almost automatically without thinking, and I've set this up to 17.8K. This value down here, the degeneration resistor to combat dynamic error, has been set at 1K. This value over here, 242 ohms. So looking at the spec here, this looks like 4 milliamps, and this looks like 1 milliamp. Okay? The rationale here is don't waste current in the reference, you want useful current. Here we have our current mirror. Our current mirror is based upon PNP type devices, and this area, this side, is a VBE short circuit. That's got one really bad implication. We only have one output. Okay? Remember that. If you're using mirrors in the load, you only have one output from the circuit. You can't take the output from here, from this side, because you've got the short circuit from the base to collector, cross VBE. This side you don't have that, so it can dynamically vary. As you've said, Gains in this are going to be in the order of thousands, quite quickly. Why is that the case? Well, ballpark, you need to look into the current mirror to find out what the resistance is, and we find out that it's related to ROC, or the collector to emitter resistance, RCE, in the hybrid Pi model. If you've got resistors at the top here as well, they're going to add as degeneration resistors, just like they do down here, and effectively improve that impedance. So let's have a look in practice. Here's my design. I've got one milliamp in the reference, exactly as I suggested, and here I've got 3.999 milliamps in the tail. So this current here is pretty much on on spec, and here we're looking at 2 milliamps down each branch of the differential amplifier. The current mirror will try and balance that as well, so the current mirror is actually working as well dynamically, it's quite an active circuit. If I put 1 volt DC in as my bias, and I'm putting in, in this case, 100 microvolts, I'm putting in a very, very, very low signal. Remember, We'll go very non-linear, if we're not careful, um, on the input to these two transistors, to the differential. So I'm keeping my input signal low to keep it operating in the linear region. So let's find out where we come in both AC terms and DC terms. Okay. This is our input to the design. It's exactly what we would expect it to be. If we read off the peak and the peak, okay, we, we can see here 99 point, uh, sorry, 988.5 uh, millivolts, so we're very close to a 1 volt DC bias, and we can calculate our peak-to-peak -peak magnitude there. should be 200 micro. We've measured that, in this case, as 124 micro. And here we've measured the output peak-to-peak -peak value between the two. And we've got a value for that, 367 millivolts. This one down here was 124 millivolts. Technically, you could potentially put 200 in here because the losses need to be accounted for somewhere. Please notice as well, what I've been doing here... I've used ORCAD's probe tool to leverage my results. Rather than me going and having to calculate it, I've written these equations out. Max, V, 
V out B minus min V V out B. So the maximum and the minimum, and I've looked at the difference between the two. So these are true peak-to-peak -peak voltages. Okay? And I've applied them to the uh, gain calculation, and we've got 2,959 okay, as my gain. Almost 3,000, you know? Again, from a couple of transistors, I have 3,000. As you can see, this only is going to work, though, for very low-level signals. You put 2 millivolt, or 1 millivolt in there, 1 millivolt times 3,000 is 4 volts. We're probably going to hit distortion if we do that. So, let's have a look at these super beta designs. Okay, super beta designs are often a combination of two types of circuitry, common emitter and common base. In our differentials, we've been really focusing on the common emitter, where the emitters are tied together. Here's our CE amplifier. Oh, I made a mistake there. Should have been a resistor, RC here. Okay, so we've got our signal coming in. We've got DC blocking here, so we're creating a DC voltage and then we're swinging an AC signal on that. Our output will be taken, in this case, from the collector, okay, which would then be an AC amplified signal. It would be inverted. I haven't drawn it inverted there by accident. Here we have a common base design, where in this case, we're, we're creating the DC voltage on the base, but we're coupling our signal into the emitter and we're getting our output from the collector. In this case here, we're, di we're dissipating that through a coupling capacitor into a load. And here we have our source through a coupling capacitor into the emitter. Well, what would happen if we put those two together? That, in a nutshell, is cascode. And here's something very simple. We have our DC bias, 1.624, with a 100 microamp signal going in to transistor Q1. We then have transistor Q2 feeding that signal into the emitter. The base is held at a constant voltage, then going back out through collector, two, collector of Q2. So we've got input signal. The intermediate signal here, the red, is almost short circuit completely. Okay? Don't bear on these um, colors actually relating to these waveforms. Um, this color here is actually the blue. This color here is actually the red. And this green here is actually the uh, purple. It's just that when I reverse video, they change color. And I have to edit the pictures too, otherwise you can't see them because it's all black. So, what's control gain in this one? Gain is, again, a function of RE down here and the collector load resistance, but then that now being the emitter resistance in this case, and then the gain of that stage, again, is a function of collector and emitter. So it's quite a complex equation. We do find at this node that we actually seem to attenuate the signal because we're going from, from the output from one amp into, the, into another amp. We can clearly see there's some advantages there. If we put this into a differential mode, we'll end up with something complex. There's our CE, and there's our CB. Com common emitter, common base. Here's our differential. This is, a, this is a differential cascode that's called super beta. One of the reasons this is super beta is to do with these two diodes in this location. Let's just work through what's happening. We have a differential, okay? V in A, V in B. We have a DC potential created via a current mirror feeding into two diode drops from this potential at the emitter. Let's call that one VE. So we know that, we know that this one is VE um, minus 2VD. Okay, where VD is controllable via the current 
fed from this current reference, current PNP mirror. And down the tail here, we've got a tail current, IT, which has to account for the current through the two diodes and the current down each branch of the differential. As you can see, this is starting to get quite sophisticated now. And, of course, that tail current was controlled via this NPN reference line. As you can see, I haven't done super beta. I've just done a very, very quick current reference cell just so that it works you know, quite quickly. There are other ways we could make this work, or other ways we could leverage it. One of the big advantages with this design is because we've clamped this, or, or these nodes just here, to two VBE, or two VD uh, diode drops, we're basically saying that it's a very low level signal that's coming in, never too big, therefore you're operating in the linear portion of the differential. Well, that's quite a complicated design. Common emitter here, common base here, NPN mirrors in the bottom to create the tail current, and a PNP mirror at the top to force current into the bias network. We need to make sure as well that the NPN current source down the bottom is substantially greater than the PNP current mirror in the top. And our 2VD makes this the super beta structure. Here's an example of what we get from that design. Gain was easily greater than 100. This wasn't an optimized design. It wasn't looking at anything in particular. But we can see here uh, we have um, our input signal at this point, almost at 1 volt DC bias. Okay, and then we have our output signal here uh, from 2 voltages. Well, what else do we need to know about inside our differentials? Well, how do we bias them? We can ground bias them, where in effect we just connect the base at any given node of the transistor through resistance down to ground. That basically couples them to the DC level 0 volts, because the supply rail is possibly at minus 10, and the positive rail could be at plus 10. So because you're at you got 20 volts, putting 0 volts here gives you a reference point. Often we will bias at 0 volts because our signal, our differential signal that's coming in here, okay, could be biased at 0 volts. I personally prefer putting resistors and current sources. So I've got a current source down here and then one resistor. That gives me the ability to control the DC level at this node and the DC level at this node. So I've got R, I sync, R, I sync. So that's sort of one of the ways that I always try and do things, just using resistors and constant current sources. The constant current source has a very high resistance, so the input impedance will fall back to being R bias. Okay. Notice up here I've got R bias. I'm using parameters in this design. There are other kinds of circuit as well where we can bootstrap bias, so we're just injecting a very small amount of current. If you're interested in some of the more advanced or esoteric ways, check the uh, Gray, Hurst, Lewis and Mayer book, Analysis and Design of Analog Integrated Circuits. Well, one of the big problems with the differential is, is what's my DC out from the differential? because I'm using RC to control the gain. Well, we don't really worry about it. We can create an intermediate stage, then use emitter follower circuits. OK, so we're going to get one VBE drop here. You've seen the DC shifts before. Uh, I think that was uh, section four. We then use a current source in the tail here, or in the bottom of the uh, device, and a single resistor. So we now can control the DC level. Now the one way that we do that is we usually get this as a specification. So we're told, I don't know, um, minus 3 volts DC might be our spec. We build our differential and we find that it's at 4 volts uh, DC with respect to our plus 10 minus 10. 
Okay, so first off we would subtract 1 VBE for the amount of current flowing. So we'd have 4 volts minus VBE. Okay, and then what we would do is we would also subtract, or we would um, subtract this value, our 3 volts, okay, minus 3 volts, minus minus 3 volts is plus 3 volts, okay, and then we would um, divide through by our current and we would achieve our simple value of resistance. So it's quite a straightforward circuit. So we can compensate for any different value of DC quite quickly. Simply by an emitter follower, resistors and then current sources. So as a review, we've got a small signal equivalent model simplification that helps us design. That works for differential. We've got a different one that works for common mode signals. We've looked at very large gains using mirror loads. We've looked at cascade stage differential amplifiers where we've got common base following common uh, emitter, and we've looked at both um, DC shifts in the output and also uh, 